In uh, 1960, a pastor by the name of Wayne Reese was in his first pastorate. It was uh, the day before Easter, and they had a youth program that they were doing at their church, and afterwards, he had to take one of the kids home. And so he drove, drives this student home, drops him off at his house, and turns around and is heading back uh, to his place, but he realized he forgot to fill up with gas. And so here he is out in the middle of really nowhere, he runs out of gas. On the night before Easter, I mean, the big day for preachers, right? It, it's kind of a big deal. And so he's worried, what am I going to do? And he just comes out of the car. He knows he ran out of gas. And so he begins to walk and walk and walk. He feels like he walked for about two hours, but turned out it was about 30 minutes. He comes upon this biker bar. And he sees this is really the only place that he can go. And so he's thinking, well, I mean, I'm not dressed like them. I don't have tattoos like them. I don't have chains or leather or a big motorcycle, but maybe there's hope inside of there. So he goes in. And, you know, as soon as he walks in, these guys look at him like, who is this guy? He does not belong here. And they thought he was just a mark, and so they're going to take him to the pool table and try to win some money from him, right? What they didn't know is that Wayne played quite a bit of pool when he was in seminary, <laughs> and he got really good at it. And so they let him break, and he cleared the whole table, beat them at their own game. And they said, what are you, a shark? What are you doing here? He said, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a preacher. I, I took somebody home, and I ran out of gas, and I, I walked here, and I thought maybe, you know, you could help me out. What are you doing in this place? Why are you here? Well, I, 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 I'm lost. I need your help. And they asked him about, you know, what it meant to be a pastor and what Easter was because he had brought that up that this is the big night for me. I'm trying to get ready for the Easter sermon. And to his astoundment, one of these guys named Roy said, I, I've never been to church. I don't know what Easter is. Can you tell us what Easter is? And Wayne thought, how am I going to do this in their vernacular? And so he tries his best to tell the story. And he says, there's this guy. His name was Jesus. And, you know, he gathered around him 12 friends, his, his gang. And, and they did some really cool things. They roamed the countryside. And they, you know, taught about peace and love and grace and forgiveness of God. And Jesus did amazing things. But the authorities, they, they didn't appreciate him and they were looking for a way to take him out, to try to kill him. Well, one night, one of his gang, this guy named Judas, ratted him out and Jesus was arrested and they hung him on a cross and they killed him. But three days later, they went to his tomb and he wasn't there. He'd been raised from the dead. God had raised Jesus from the dead and gave him new life. That's the story of Easter. And Roy said, man, that's an amazing story. And Wayne said, I know. God is an awesome God. And suddenly they recognized it was silent in the bar. Everybody was listening to the story. And you know, guys don't like silence. And so somebody said, ah, let's get him some gas and get him on down the road. And so he hops on one of the bikes and drives off with one of these, you know, Hell's Angels guys. And they siphoned gas out of somebody's tank and put it in his and sent him on his way. And the next day, that Sunday, he's getting ready for the service and the song leader is up there giving it his old college try, you know, singing songs and they hear this rumble in the distance and then the head usher looks out and, and there are all these big bad motorcycles coming towards the church. Harley Davidson's men dressed in leather pulling up parking in front of the church and his eyes are this big and he looks at Roy or looks at Wayne like what am I supposed to do and let him in and so these guys come in and and they deacon said well can I help you and and Roy this one who listened intently last night he said hey 
We're here to, we're here to hear the shark. We want to hear him tell that Easter story again. And they said, come on in. And Roy, or Roy sat there and listened to Wayne as Wayne once again told the greatest story that has ever been told. Isn't it time that everybody hears this story? Isn't it time that this story gets beyond these walls? This is the season, guys. This is the time to share the greatest news that has ever been told, the story about Jesus Christ. Sally Lloyd-Jones, she wrote this. She said, there are lots of stories in the Bible, but all the stories are telling one big story. The story of how God loves his children and comes to rescue them. It takes the whole Bible to tell this story. And at the center of the story, there is a baby. Every story in the Bible whispers his name. He's like the missing piece in a puzzle. The piece that makes all the other pieces fit together and suddenly you can see a beautiful picture. And we've been waiting, haven't we? So patiently you've been waiting for this last puzzle piece and we're almost there and we'll spend the next several weeks putting that last puzzle piece down so that we can see what the whole picture is. So if you've been reading the story, you know where we're at. And you'll know also that it'll be impossible to give an exhaustive series of sermons about the life of Jesus. I did a sermon series a few weeks ago, a few years ago, called One Perfect Life. We spent 60 weeks on the life of Jesus. Some of you may remember that. If not, find it on YouTube. Maybe you can know more about Jesus than you ever thought you could. But today and for the next few weeks, we're not going to go into massive amounts of detail, but just hitting the high points. Jesus Christ has finally arrived on the scene. We left him last week in the temple with his parents saying, I must be about my father's business. And his father's business is to redeem mankind. And we lose track of Jesus for about 18 years. Nothing is really said of him until John the Baptist arrives on the scene. This brand new prophet, this voice crying in the wilderness, this, this, this finger pointing, this light shining, saying, there's one coming whose sandals I'm not even worthy to unlatch. He is going to be here. And we know that John eventually did baptize Jesus. And it's an inter- interesting thought, isn't it, that Jesus was baptized, that he would even need to be baptized. And John thought the very thing. What am I I baptizing you for? You ought to be baptizing me. And Jesus said, I'm baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus was like an Old Testament priest who would be baptized into the priesthood in order to make sacrifice for the people. Jesus would become our high priest, would become the one who would make the one ultimate sacrifice for us. After his baptism, he was led away by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. For 40 days, he didn't eat. And the devil came to him when he was at his weakest and three times tempted him, even using scripture. But Jesus just battled back and eventually the devil left him, waiting for a more opportune time. Jesus came back down and John the Baptist announced to everybody, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the Lamb of God, not the Lion of Judah. That would have been so much more macho, but the Lamb of God, the one who will die for you. Jesus chose his disciples, most of them by now, His first miracle was turning water into wine. Do you remember that comical escapade where his mom says, hey, uh, Jesus, these guys ran out of wine. I think you can handle it. And what does Jesus say? Mom, what are you doing? It's not my time yet. And Jesus continued to say, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Heal somebody. Don't tell anybody. And what did they do? They told everybody, didn't they? Jesus couldn't go anywhere without people knowing who he was. 
He went to Jerusalem and he cleared the temple because he saw all these religious people who were taking money, who were absolutely reprobate, hypocritical in their faith, turning tables over, letting animals go. You will not turn my father's house, which is a house of prayer, into a den of thieves. This is supposed to be a, a house of prayer for all people. And he was angry. I'm not sure if it was because of that that one of these Pharisees said, hey, Jesus, can we, can we get together? I'd like to talk to you. And his name was Nicodemus. And they met together at night. And Nicodemus is trying to be all nice. You know, we believe you're a teacher sent from God and trying to, you know, butter him up. And Jesus just cuts to the chase. Nicodemus, you must be born again. That's it. I love it. Jesus doesn't have any time for small talk. You must be born again. And we find out that Nicodemus did become a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus met people all over. The woman at the well in Jericho who'd been married six times and was not married to the man she was living with. And Jesus asked for a drink and he told her, you know, if you drink from me, you will find water that, well, you'll never be thirsty again. And this woman went away saying, I think I found Messiah. Could it be? Jesus healed a royal son's, a royal official's son. He cast out demons. So by now his his popularity had reached quite a level. And he makes his way back into the Galilee region. And now, after this time, he's ready to announce his intention. And so Luke chapter 4 is where we'll be. And I love this passage of scripture. It's just so profound and powerful. Jesus announcing who he is. So in verse 14 of chapter 4 of Luke, Jesus returned to Galilee and the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. Of course it had. And he was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. Started out pretty good, didn't it? And he went to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. This is what Jesus did. Jesus was in the synagogue when the synagogue was open. He listened to teaching. He'd been taught at that very synagogue, probably went to elementary school at that very synagogue. And now he's the one who's going to get to read and preach. So he stood up to read. And this is where it gets so good, so amazing. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. What a coincidence, isn't it? All the books in the Old Testament. Let's give him Isaiah. That's so good. And so unrolling it, he found the place where it is written because he knew the scroll. And a scroll was, you know, not like our Bibles that we open like this. You had to unroll them different ways and find, you know, what you were looking for. And he knew exactly what he was looking for. And he turned that scroll to the book of Isaiah chapter 61. And he read this, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. And in Isaiah, it says to bind up the brokenhearted. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Oh, it's so good. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And every eye in the synagogue was fastened on him. Now was the time to preach. And he began his sermon by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I just want to let that linger for a minute. Isaiah was written over 400 years ago. These people had been reading Isaiah for over 400 years. The promise from Genesis chapter 3, 4,000 years. They've been waiting for the Savior 
They've been waiting for God to keep his promise. All of the sacrifices, all of the blood, all of the lambs that were slain, all of the goats, all of the ox, all of the wheat that's thrown on the altar is saying, God, keep your promise. God, keep your promise. You told Abraham that you would send somebody to keep this promise. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting 4,400 years. And Jesus Christ, at this moment in time, in this backwater little synagogue in Nazareth, says, I'm here. It's fulfilled. I mean, I don't know what you would think at that moment. This is what we've been longing for. This is what we've been waiting for. The Savior is here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the broken heart, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And in reading this passage and explaining it, Jesus gives his reasons for appearing. And it's really interesting. There are six metaphors that he uses. There are six phrases that he throws out to say, this is why I came. And by saying this, what he's saying, and I'll just say this to you, that it's, it's about the remedy for sin. And Jesus is saying, in effect here, sin It bankrupted you. Sin, it broke you. Sin has imprisoned you. Sin has blinded you. Sin has wearied you. And sin has indebted you. And I am here to rescue you. One old writer wrote this. It's so good. He said, who is he that digs digs a a man's grave? Who is the painted temptress who steals his virtue? Who is the murderess that destroys his life? Who is the sorceress that first deceives and then damns his soul? Sin. Who with icy breath blights the fair blossoms of youth? Who breaks the hearts of parents? Who brings old men's gray hairs with sorrow to the grave? Sin. Who changes gentle children into vipers, tender mothers into monsters, and fathers into worse than Herod's, the murderers of their own innocence? Sin. Who casts the apple of discord in a household hearts? Who lights the torch of war and bears it blazing over trembling lands? Who by division in the church rends Christ's seamless robe? Sin, what fair siren is this who seated on a rock by the deadly pool smiles to deceive, sings to allure, kisses to betray, and flings her arms around our neck to plunge with us into perdition. Sin, who turns the soft and gentlest heart to stone, who hurls reason from her lofty throne and impels sinners mad as gathering swine down a precipice into a lake of fire. Sin. If anyone asks you what the message is of the Bible, you can tell them that the message of the Bible is salvation. The message of the Bible is that God, the creator of the universe, graciously rescues doomed sinners from the eternal punishment of hell and brings them instead to the eternal glories of heaven. From Genesis 3, when the the serpent did his job, all the way to Revelation 22, the, the theme is salvation, that God is buying us back, that he's reestablishing paradise and it's fulfilled in this person Jesus Christ and he reveals it to his own people in his own synagogue in his own town at this moment and he says this is why I've come I've come to preach good news to the poor that word poor is an amazing word it doesn't mean just not having much 
It's actually the Greek word patokos, which means literally to cringe, to shrink back, or to cower. It conveys the idea of a beggar who's in the streets of Jerusalem and he's, he's, he's reaching out with one hand while he covers his face with the other because he's embarrassed about his condition. And I've come to preach good news to the beggar on the street of Jerusalem, spiritually speaking, those who are bankrupted spiritually, who have nothing to offer him. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Every sinner is morally bankrupt. Every sinner, in the words of Isaiah, has a righteousness like filthy rags. Every sinner is destitute of anything to commend them to God. And the only people that Jesus will bring to salvation are poor sinners who recognize their own sinfulness. As long as you think that you're good enough, that you're bright enough, that your righteousness does it, you are so wrong. Only when you recognize that I'm poor, I'm wretched, I need a savior, that's when the good news takes effect. He came also to bring, to, to bind up the brokenhearted. Uh, this is sort of a, a reaction to the first. If I know that I'm poor, then my heart immediately breaks. I, I know my condition before you, God, and it, it breaks my heart, and I need you to fix what is broken. Everything is broken, right? We learned that from the fall. The great theologian Bob Dylan doesn't miss it. In his song, Everything is Broken, listen to this brilliant poetry. Broken lines, broken strings, broken threads, broken springs, broken idols, broken heads, people sleeping in broken beds. Ain't no use jiving, ain't no use joking. Everything is broken. Broken bottles, broken plates, broken switches, broken gates, broken dishes, broken parts. Streets are filled with broken hearts, broken words never meant to be spoken. Everything is broken. Seems like every time you stop and turn around, something else just hit the ground. Broken cutters, broken saws, broken buckles, broken laws, broken bodies, broken bones, broken voices on broken phones. Take a deep breath, feel like you're choking. Everything is broken. Broken hands on broken plows, broken treaties, broken vows. Broken pipes, broken tools, people bending broken rules. Hound dog howling, bullfrog croaking, everything is broken. And when we understand our brokenness, then we go to God in our brokenness. This is David in Psalm 51 saying, you and you alone have I sinned against. I, I, I need you to restore me. Uh, Create in me a, a clean heart, O oh God, and, and restore a, a new spirit within me. Don't remove your Holy Spirit from me. Remind me of the joy of your salvation. I, I need you, God. I'm broken. I'm, I'm, I'm destitute. It's the, it's the publican, the, the tax collector who's praying at the temple, pounding on his chest, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. My sins are ever before me. Oh God, I need you to have mercy on me. And it's God who responds by saying, he went away justified. He came to bandage the brokenhearted. He came to proclaim freedom to the prisoners. And when you hear prisoners, I want you to think of prisoners of war. I want you to think of somebody that's been taken into captivity, either by sin or self or Satan, some addiction, something they just can't get past, and it ruins them, and it breaks them. I, I, I watched, I told you, Billy Graham's funeral, and there was so much said there, but the thing that really 
hit me was when one of his daughters got up to speak. Billy Graham's daughter. She said, I was married for 21 years. And we got divorced. And I met another guy at church. And we fell in love. And my kids said, Mom, don't go that way. But I married him anyway. And the night of my marriage, I knew I'd made a mistake. And in time, that marriage ended as well. And she said, I had to go back home. I had to go back home. The daughter of Billy Graham. What's daddy going to say? And she said, I made my way up that winding driveway and I got to their place and there's daddy standing on the porch and before I could say a word he just wrapped his arms around me and he said welcome home <laughs> that's grace that's beautiful when we're broken and we see it and we go to God, there is no condemnation there. That is when grace is poured out to us. It's offered to us. That's why Charles Wesley wrote, he breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. That is good news. But that's not all he came for. He came to provide sight to the blind. You know, I find it interesting that most every Sunday, I know, I know that I preach to dead people and I know that I preach to blind people. Some of you here are dead spiritually. You can't hear a word. And some of you are blind spiritually. I can't, I can't, I can't bring you to life. I can't make you see. I remember telling you a story about a seminary professor that took his students out to a cemetery and he said to them preach 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 to dead people because that's what you do and unless God does something to raise them up your words are meaningless and my prayer is that you dead people would come to life you blind people would see some of you are blind because you just can't see, because you're born in blindness. I mean, we all are to a certain degree. The Bible says in Psalm 82, 5, they do not know, nor do they understand. They walk in darkness. <clears throat> Others, we have listened so long, we've looked so hard, that our hearts have grown so hard that according to Scripture, God could actually be hardening your hearts. John 12, 40 says, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn to him and be healed. If you've heard this message over and over and over and over again and you've never repented, you've never trusted Christ, then it gets harder and harder and harder and the, and the, and the cataracts on your eyes get thicker and thicker and thicker. And if you're in that spot and you're blind and you know it, you've got to say, God, I cannot see. And the only way I can see is if you will let me see. And then there are those who are just blinded by the enemy. The God of this world has blinded their eyes. There's a depth to that blindness. There's a comprehensiveness to that blindness that is so thick that only the miraculous working of the Spirit of God in you will ever change that. And the Messiah said, I've come to give sight to the blind, to open blind eyes. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will never walk in darkness. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, it is God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. When Paul, who was Saul, was on the road to Damascus, and God blinded him so that he could see. It was like scales dropped off of his eyes because he could finally see. And Jesus said, I've come that the blind might see. And oh, when you see, what you will see is incredible. 
For 51 years, a guy by the name of Bob, Bob Edens was blind. He couldn't see a thing. His world was a black hall of sounds and smells. But then through the miracle of surgery, his sight was restored. And this is what he says. I never would have dreamed that yellow is so yellow. <laughs> he said, I just don't have the words. I'm amazed by yellow, but red is my favorite color. I just can't believe red. <laughs> for those of us that have seen red, it's like, I don't get it. But to see it for the first time must be absolutely mind-blowing. I can see the shape of the moon. And like nothing better than seeing a jet plane flying across the sky, leaving a vapor trail. And of course, sunrises and sunsets. And at night, I look up at the stars and the sky. You could never know. How wonderful everything is. Oh, to have your sight restored. And the Messiah has come to restore it. So if you're blind today, would you just pray, God, open my eyes. I want to see. And the next thing, Jesus says, I've come to provide rest for the weary. It's kind of like a catch-all here. Everything else that's been stacking up against you is so wearying. You know, the whole Old Testament, right? I mean, it's all been so wearisome, hasn't it? Just try, keep these commandments, do these things, do better, try harder. It just is insane. And so many people think that's it. But when do you stop and you get so burdened by trying? And Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I commend a book to you. You need to find this book. It's a very simple book. It's written by Max Lucado, entitled, He Still Moves Stones. There's a chapter in that book that I think expresses my feelings on this point he tells this story that isn't true, but he imagines it. He said, imagine you're, uh, you have a free Saturday, and so you get up in the morning, and you find out that there's this exhibit in the local library. The local exhibit is entitled Bruised Reeds and Smoldering Wicks, and you're curious, what does that mean? And so you go to the library, and you see in this place all of these portraits they're on easels, and they're all back to back. And you go to the first one, and you see that it's, it's a leper. His, his fingers are missing. His, his, his face is covered, and there are people running away. And you see, unclean, unclean. Because, you know, that's the way it was for a leper. He couldn't just show up in town. He had to clap boards together all the time and say, unclean unclean, unclean, and everybody had to run away from him. He was lonely. He was isolated. He was going to die this miserable death. And this is the picture. But then you go to the other side of it, and it's the same man. But his fingers are all there. His skin is baby soft, and he's got a smile on his face. And the caption says, I am willing, be healed. And you go from picture to picture. There's one where this guy's just obviously possessed by a demon. He's this wild looking guy. And the next side, he's sitting quietly. You see a woman who is bleeding. The next side, she's healed. All these different sides and other sides of paintings. It's, it's what Jesus came to do. It's the paralytic who's healed it's the blind man who can see. It's the woman at the well who's restored. It's Nicodemus, that religious man who's finally discovered grace. A bruised reed, Matthew 12, 20 says, he will not break. And a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Those who are weary of running, who are trying, who are just full of themselves and their sinful life, they're just tired. 
and they're weary. And what most people think is that God hates them, that he's trying to destroy them, but God is running after them to restore them. And this is what Lakato writes. He says, is there anything more frail than a bruised reed? Look at the bruised reed at the water's edge, a once slender and tall stalk of sturdy river grass. It is now bowed and bent. Are you a bruised reed? Was it so long ago that you stood tall and proud? You were upright and sturdy, nourished by the waters and rooted in the riverbed of confidence. Then something happened. You were bruised by harsh words, by a friend's anger, by a spouse's betrayal, by your own sin, by religion's rigidity. And you were wounded, bent ever so slightly. And your hollow reed, once straight, is now stooped and hidden in the bulrush. And the smoldering wick on the candle, is there anything closer to death than a smoldering wick? Once a flame, now flickering and failing, still warm from yesterday's passion, but no fire. Not yet cold, but far from hot. Was it long ago you blazed with faith, remembering how you illuminated the path? And then came the wind, the cold wind, the harsh wind, the constant wind wore down upon you. Oh, you stood strong for a moment, maybe even a lifetime. But the endless blast whipped your flickering flame, leaving you one pinch away from darkness. A, breeze, a bruised reed and a smoldering wick. Society knows what to do with you. The world has a place for the beaten. The world will break you off. The world will snuff you out. But the artist of scripture proclaims that God won't. Painted on the canvas, on canvas after canvas, is the tender touch of a creator who has special place for the bruised and the weary of the world. A God who is friend of the wounded heart. A God who is the keeper of your dreams. That's the theme of the New Testament. That's the proclamation of Jesus. He came to set you free. But lastly, and this one is so good, he came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. <laughs> what does that mean? Go back to Leviticus 25, and you'll find this this thing that happened in Israel every 50 years. It was called the year of Jubilee. In the year of Jubilee, all of the slaves were freed. All of the debts were canceled. All of your property was returned to you because it belonged to you once. And Jesus is saying to the Jews, to us, I'm returning your standing with God. I am recreating Eden. I'm bringing you back into relationship. This is the year of Jubilee. This is what you're meant for. This is what you were created for, to walk not as slaves, not in debt, not, not as prisoners, but you own your faith. You walk with God. You have a relationship with him. He calls you his sons and his daughters. Woo! That's good stuff. That's amazing. And this is what he's come for. He's come to set you free. He's come to give you freedom. He's come to give back what the enemy has stolen from you. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know this. Spend this week looking at that, seeing what this means to me. But here's the question. What is the reaction to his coming? I mean, if it was us, right? And Jesus came in and he said, hey guys, today's the day. You've been waiting for it. All this waiting, it's over. I'm here, I'm here to rescue you. It's now. I hope your response would not be, hey, what are they cooking back there? We're having a potluck later? Oh, yeah, cool. No. 
You're waiting for the long-awaited Messiah. How did they respond? How did these people who knew the law, who knew the Torah, who'd been waiting, what's their response? It's apathy. At first, it's like, oh, Jesus is come. Isn't that cute? And Joseph and Mary's boys here, and, and he's going to read. He's going to read from the Torah for us. Isn't that sweet? One of our own's come back. What a what a precious boy you are. Welcome. God bless your little soul. And that's kind of the way it was. It wasn't like, have you heard about this Jesus? I mean, he's done. Great. Maybe he's the guy. And so at first they were just apathetic. To quote Lewis again, Christianity, if it is false, is of no importance. If it is true, it is of infinite importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. I'm just going to add Jesus to my life. No. If this is true, this changes everything. Your life ought to be different. But they were just, uh. but then it turned from apathy to anger. Did you notice that? I mean, he just started his sermon with, today this has been fulfilled in your presence. And then he went to preaching, and he went to meddling, and went to stepping on toes. He was like, you're going to say, go ahead, heal yourself, physician. You're just from Nazareth. Who are you? You're just Joseph's son. I know what's in your heart. And by the time he finished his sermon, it wasn't an invitation to come to Jesus. It was an invitation to kill Jesus. And they wanted to take him out and throw him off of a cliff. <laughs> They've been waiting for thousands of years for Messiah to come, and now they're going to kill him. Wow. Wow. So you can respond with apathy. You can respond with anger. But here's what I would suggest. Awakening. Oh, this is true. No, no, seriously. Think about it, all right? This is true. Jesus is real. The resurrection, which we'll talk about in a few weeks, is absolutely life-changing. And I pray that your life has been somehow transformed by this truth. I will close with this. From a great book, again, that I would commend to you called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. Jim Simbola preaches at a place called the Brooklyn Tabernacle. A tough place to plant a church. And this is what he writes after one of the services. It was Easter Sunday, and I was so tired at the end of the day that I just went to the edge of the platform, pulled down my tie, sat down and draped my feet over the edge. It was a wonderful service with many people coming forward. The counselors were talking with these people, and as I was sitting there, I looked up in the middle aisle, and there in about the third row was a man who looked to be about 50 disheveled, filthy. He looked up at me rather sheepishly as if to say, C could we talk? Oh, we have homeless people come all the time asking for money or whatever. So I sat there. I said to myself, though I'm ashamed of it, what a way to end a Sunday. I've had such a good time preaching and ministering and here, here's a fellow probably wanting some more money for wine. And he walked up. And when he got within about five feet of me, I smelled a horrible smell like I'd never smelled in my life. It was so awful that when he got close, I would inhale by looking away. And then I'd talk to him. And then I'd look away because I couldn't inhale facing him. I asked him, what's your name? David. How long have you been on the streets? Six years. How old are you? 32. He looked 50. Hair matted, front teeth missing, eyes slightly glazed. Uh, where did you sleep last night, David? In an abandoned truck? I keep in my back pocket a money clip. I fumble to pick it out, thinking I'll give him some money. I won't even get a volunteer. They're all busy talking with others. Usually we don't give money to people. We usually take them out 
but I took the money out. And David pushed his finger in front of me. He said, I don't want your money. I want this Jesus. The one you were talking about because I'm not going to make it. I'm going to die on the street. <laughs> I completely forgot about David and I started to weep for myself. I was going to give a couple dollars to someone God had sent to me. See how easy it is? I can make the excuse I was tired. There is no excuse. I was not seeing him the way God sees him. I was not feeling what God feels, but oh, did I change. And David just stood there. He didn't know what was happening. I pleaded with God, God, forgive me, forgive me. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry to represent you this way. I'm so sorry. Here I am with my message and my points, and you send somebody, and I am not ready for it. Oh, God. Something came over me. Suddenly, I started to weep deeper, and David began to weep. He fell, he fell against my chest as I was sitting there. He fell against my white shirt and tie. And I put my arms around him, and there we, we each wept with one another. And the smell of his person became a beautiful aroma. Here's what I thought the Lord made real to me. If you don't love this smell, I can't use you. Because this is why I called you where you are. This is what you're about. You are about this smell. And Christ changed David's life. <laughs> he started memorizing portions of scripture that were incredible. We got him a place to live. We hired him in the church to do maintenance and we got his teeth fixed. He was a handsome man when he came out of the hospital. They detoxed him in six days. He spent that Thanksgiving at my house. He also spent Christmas at my house. When we were exchanging presents, he pulled out a little thin present and he said, this is for you. It was a white hanky. It was all he could afford. A year later, David got up and talked about his conversion to Christ. And the minute he took the mic and began to speak, I said, that man is a preacher. This past Easter, he was ordained. He is an associate minister of a church over in New Jersey. And I was so close to saying, here, take this. I'm a busy preacher. But something happened, didn't it? David's eyes were opened. David's prison gates were opened. He'd been set free. He heard, he understood. That's what Jesus came to do, to transform lives. That when we hear this, we are not apathetic about it. We're not angry about it. We are awakened by it. So the, the last question really is, what is your reaction to his appearing? Would you just evaluate yourself? Don't miss him. Don't miss him. He can change your life. He longs to do that. Thank you, Lord, for this little portion of scripture. <laughs> Oh, Lord, every point could have been a sermon. There's so much I want to say. I just pray, God, that your spirit would be working right now. What we asked you earlier, Lord, tell me what you want, and I'll do it. And whatever you're saying right now, God, to these folks, I pray that they hear it, and they respond. Lord, I pray, I pray for the broken heart that you'd bind it up. I pray for the poor in spirit, that they would just go to you like a beggar and they would see that you give abundantly. Oh Lord, I pray for the blind that right now you would open their eyes. I pray for those that are in prison to whatever it is, that you would just release them. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen the weary and that you would show them that you have come to to forgive their debts 
to, to give back that relationship that they, they, were, they were rightfully given at the creation. And that, Lord, you would, you would let them know that they are no longer slaves. They are no longer prisoners. They are your children. Oh, Jesus, I pray that you'd speak. Thank you for coming to do just what you said you would do. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is awesome. He is um, beyond explanation. Um, this is my, my favorite, one of my favorite scriptures in, in, in all of the Bible. And, um, and just to, to know that there is a promise um, of, of freedom and of um, being broken away from bondage and having our, our brokenness bound up, there's, there's nothing more that at least tugs at me to say yes to him. Um, this past week, I was just reminded of this, this past week I had a, an acquaintance who, who sent me a Facebook message, and um, I just want just to read it real quick to you. Um, he said, I'm having a lot of issues in my life, struggling to find myself and what kind of things that will make me happy or a better person. I've started to become a very selfish and self-destructive person. I didn't know if you had any suggestions or options that I could try. <laughs> I don't think he knows that I'm a pastor, actually. <laughs> um, but we, we kind of exchanged some, some questions and answers, and, um, and, and, I, and I said to him, I said, man, you know, I could give you lots of things to go do, and it could work for a little bit, and there could be some false hope there, but I'm just going to be really honest with you. The, the only thing or the only one that I know that transforms in such a way that will actually change you and not just change your behavior is Jesus. And I don't know if you're a Christian or not, but man, this, this is the only way that you can find freedom from your selfishness, freedom from your self-destructive behavior. Um, it's the only thing I've found. Uh, it's the only thing that's worked. And, and there is so much more as well. And so this young man, you know, he's, he's at a place where I, I don't know what he's going to do with that information. And it's not up to me. Holy Spirit can do the work there. But, um, but that's what we have to offer. And so for those of you, if, maybe if you don't know Jesus in that way, this might be a day that you can say yes to him, say yes to his invitation. For some of you, for a lot of you in here, you know Jesus in that way. You've, you've been saved from your sin. You have said yes to him. And yet there are still places where you are held captive. There are still places where you are slaves to that sin that's been taken care of. And I just want to encourage you today to ask Jesus and to reflect, just as Todd was talking about, on the places that maybe you are still stuck. Um, TJ, could you do me a favor? Could you pull up the bridge for this next song that we have? Um, the words of this bridge, I think, just are so perfect uh, for Isaiah 61, for what we've just heard from Jesus. And it's really the identification of what uh, has happened and then uh, what Jesus offers us. And so it says this, I needed rescue. My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. And then go to the next one. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Then now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. And now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My, don't go to the next one though. Okay, stay there. So I have a future. My eyes are open because when you called my name, and we'll get there in just a second. Okay, so stand with us. Stand with us here this morning. Let's sing Glorious Day. It's, it's probably the perfect song for where we're at. So let's sing together. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind? 